Um, welcome everyone to the 15th Asia Pacific Sociological Association two-day webinar on COVID-19, climate and health. Our session today is broadcasted live on Facebook page of APSA 2020 as seen on your screens. That's Asia Pacific Sociological Association 2020 Manila. Please be guided of the house rules for today's session. All guests and participants are automatically muted upon entry. The ceremony will be recorded for documentation purposes. For panelists, please keep your video off and your microphone muted, especially if it is not your turn to speak. For panelists also, you will be hearing this bell when you only have three minutes and one minute left. Through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, so our team can note this and raise it during our open forum. Questions to the panelists using the Q&A option at the bottom of your screens. We begin this webinar with a welcome message from the Ateneo de Manila University President, Father Roberto Siap, who is also the project holder of the Coastal City at Risk in the Philippines Investing in Climate and Disaster Resilience Project. May we now play the video of Father Roberto C. Yap. As we wait for technical um, issues, um, I shall remind all the new attendees coming in. For attendees, please send your questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of, our, of your screen so our team can note this and raise it during our open forum. When you make your questions, please suggest this to the panelists so we can note who the question is for. There are, there's also a chat option for our attendees. So you can send in your questions through the chat as well. Ina, I think maybe you can, the book of yes, abstracts no? are open to them already. The text of Father right, Bobby. Right. The text of Father Bobby and all the messages are there. So if we have problems with the technical, which we can never predict, perhaps you can tell them that the book of abstracts are in their emails, right? Thank you, Doc Emma. Yes, uh, we've just released the book of abstracts this morning in the, in the Philippines, in the, the, the Facebook page. So to visit the book of abstracts, that's bit.ly slash APSA 2020 BOA. Again, that's bit.ly slash APSA 2020 BOA. On behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University community, I welcome you to the 2020 webinar of the Asia Pacific Sociological Association. The global COVID 19 pandemic has affected all aspects of our lives and will continue to do so for many years to come. I am therefore pleased to know that you have chosen to focus on its impact on our society, especially on our health systems and climate and disaster resilience. As you yourselves have stated, the pandemic's impact is worse on socially vulnerable groups. And if we hope to mitigate this, then we have to begin with an understanding of its far-reaching effects on our social systems. The breadth and depth of sociology is crucial to this understanding. Your study and research into human social relationships and institutions can help guide a response to the complex challenges facing our world, guide the crafting of governmental and institutional policies to address these issues, and guide strategies for extensive uptake of possible solutions. In her brief message in the webinar poster, the APSA president, Dr. Miwako Hosoda, challenged you to collaborate with the entire society in the search for actions that can help to cope with the dramatic situations faced all over the world. I echo this challenge and look forward to hearing about more interdisciplinary projects involving members of your sociological associations for the benefit of our region and the world. Again, welcome to APSA 2020 Manila, and I wish you all an illuminating webinar. Thank you very much, Father Bobby. 
We now welcome Dr. Melanie Robertson, the Senior Program Specialist of the Climate Change Program of the International Development Research Center Canada. Play video. Good morning, everybody. I'm Melanie Robertson, a Senior Program Specialist at the International Development Center, IDRC. IDRC has been proud to support the project Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines. I'm delighted to have the opportunity this morning to thank Dr. Roberto Yap, President of Ateneo de Manila University, and Tonya Yolo Loizaga, President of the National Resilience Council, and Professor Maiwako Hosada, President of the Asia Pacific Sociological Association, for supporting this webinar and also for supporting the project. Also a special thank to you, Professor Emma Porio, and all her team of researchers and collaborators for their fantastic work and dedication since the beginning of this project, and even more during this strange time. With the global pandemic, we are experiencing challenges in every sphere of our lives. I'm really impressed on how the researchers have adapted to the situation and have continued their work with passion. The time of this webinar on COVID-19, climate and city are timely and much needed in these difficult times. It is an extremely challenging moment for cities. With the novel coronavirus infiltrating cities across the world, Leaders are now working around the clock to develop and implement policies aimed at slowing the virus. It can be seen everywhere that the situation of specifically socially vulnerable groups have become more difficult and environmental issues more serious. COVID-19 and climate change are both urgent crises and plenty has been written already about the similarities between the two. With much more sure to come as lessons from the pandemic emerge. This is a moment of opportunity to marry the best of city climate policy and virus response. While big policy conclusions, connections and questions will continue to be debated, right now they are important observations to be made and potential lessons learned for city policymakers. This conference explores some of these intersecting areas crucial for our collective work in academia, but also at RDRC. I'm wishing you a great conference with rich debate that I will follow from Ottawa in Canada. Thank you for your attention. Indeed, we are grateful for the support of IDRC. We now welcome Professor jo Jose Joel Canude, the Associate Professor of the and Chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Neo de Manila University and co-convener of APSA 2020. Father Roberto Yap, President of the Ateneo de Manila University, conveners, Miwaka Hosada of Saisa University in Japan, Sayada Zakia Hossain of the University of Sydney in Australia, Emma Porio of the Ateneo de Manila University, Surichai Wong Yeo of the Chulalongkorn University in Thailand, and Jessica Datur of Brasilia of the University of the Philippines. Good morning. In a seemingly one quick blow at the end of the northern winter months this year, we collectively saw the borders of the world shattered as the new strain of coronavirus cascaded its way across continents. Global flows were upended, movements of people severely restricted, and supply chains disrupted. Humanity braced for the worst with the direst of predictions ranging from widespread hunger in the poorer regions of the global south, breakdown of the national order of things, and the end of our freedoms. Indeed, we are seeing these predictions unfold, but in deeply disproportionate terms. We do see sufferings, precarities, and uncertainties transpiring, 
but again, in ways that further unravels already existing structural conditions highlighted in countless of sociological papers. In many ways, we collectively saw and experienced the destructive impact of the virus, not as a matter of surprise, but knowing fully well its historical antecedents and trajectories. The analytical frames of sociology have long pointed and tracked the complex but intimate interconnections of seemingly ontological opposites covering the biospheres and the social political worlds. We have known how diseases and other epidemiological conditions are as much shaped by germs and microorganisms as they are by relations of power, or how a climate is as much a mixture of chemical elements powered by earthly forces as they are political categories shaped by the forces of power. Biospheres and chemospheres are as much ecological and chemical, but also domains of social, political, and economic relations. Yet, on the other hand, it is also an arena, an area that we need to, to do more work and to offer wider and deeper understanding on these dynamics as they come in play on the ground within and across the borders of our engagements. The two-day webinar on COVID-19, climate and health, the 15th Asia-Pacific Sociological Association Conference 2020, more aptly captures the conditions that we know, but perhaps we also know less. It is in the spirit of knowing and the cry for, for an even deeper means of discussion and understanding that the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of the Ateneo de Manila University feel honored to take part as hosts of this actually relevant online event. I wish that we sociologists and anthropologists would have co-beneficial exchanges in the two days that we will be engaging with each other for knowing and learning from each other's work. Welcome to the Ateneo de Manila online and a well wish to insightful engagements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kanudai, for reminding us of the importance of sociological research, especially in a time of pandemic. Now we move to the live messages from our conference chair, starting from the main conference, Professor Emma Porio of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Ateneo de Manila, and project leader and principal investigator of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines project. Thank you very much, Ina, and thank you very much, Joel Canode, my chair, for already laying out the intellectual frames and sociological perspectives from where we should view and examine the new normal and the pandemic impact. So let me just do the, the honors of welcoming you. So good morning, everyone. I would like to say good morning, especially to people, who are the panelists who are coming from the outside, from the other side of the world and to other parts of Asia, who is right um, very early in the morning. So welcome everyone. In behalf of the uh, President Miwako Hosoda and um, all the our conveners, Welcome to the APSA 2020 uh, website uh, web, webinar series on COVID-19, climate, health, and the city. In behalf of our president, Father Roberto Yap, Miwako Hosoda, and um, our, the conveners, welcome. And we are happy that you are here. We are very grateful and privileged that you choose to share your time and the energies with us this morning. Um, I would also like to thank our president, Father Roberto Yap and Melanie Robertson for supporting us in this endeavor. Also, I would like to thank our co-convenor universities, um, Shisha University in Japan, University of Sydney, Chula Longkorn University, University of the Philippines Desires and the Philippine Sociological Society, where very grateful for these universities to convene this 
APSA 2020 with us. More especially, I would like to thank the International Sociological Association, Division of Health and Society headed by Professor Miwako Hosoda and RC46, Clinical and Applied Division of the International Sociological Association. We're very grateful for their support. But more importantly, I would like to express my gratitude for the intellectual generosity of our panelists from London, from India, from, um, from Sydney, from Thailand, and Japan, and also support from the participants who are waking up this morning, even though it's still midnight in the parts of the world. So we are very happy here in Atene de Manila to convene and to uh, organize this APSA webinar series for you. And we are very happy that we are able to do it with uh, the other panelists who have been graciously shared with them with, and with us all their studies on COVID-19, uh, the impacts to their society. In fact, when we were having a dry run yesterday, I learned a lot from India, from Australia, from Thailand, from England, and many other places on how COVID has transformed their lives and how basically the systems, the, what I will call the risk governance systems, of these places have proactively responded to the crisis as well as designed um, what I will call resilient pathways to recovery. So without much ado, because as I said, our chair has already laid out the intellectual contours of how we should examine the phenomenon of the new normal and how it is uh, affecting our lives and our societal institutions. Again, let me thank everyone for attending this seminar and being part of us, and also to share your ideas about how we should examine, how we should reflect on this new phenomenon, and what are the meanings and implications for this on our sociological uh, theorizing, methodological explorations, and um, our sociological and professional practice. I am, as our chair has said, this is going to transform. Our lives will not, you know, will be different. And I will say it, this pandemic also offers us a new way of examining our sociological lives of, of writing and of um, contributing to the intellectual production that is demanded of us now. So thank you and welcome. Uh, well, I hope you'll be with us today and tomorrow. Good, good morning to everyone. And we'll enjoy the intellectual piece that is going to open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Emma. We now welcome the co-conference co chair, Professor Miwako Osona who is also the president of the Asia-Pacific Sociological Association and vice president of Seisei University, Japan. Good morning. So on behalf of the Asia-Pacific Sociological Association, I'd like to welcome you to the 15th APSA conference. We have more than 300 enrollment this time. I think this is the biggest number of the APSA history. First, I truly appreciate Professor Emma Porio of the Ateneo de Manila University and her team for hosting this online conference. I express my sincere gratitude for Father Roberto Yap President of Ateneo de Manila University, Dr. Melanie Roberto, Senior Program Specialist, Climate Change Program, and Professor Jose Joel Cordy, Associate Professor and Chair, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Ateneo de Manila University. I deeply thank our co-host organization 
the International Sociological Association, RC15, Sociology of Health, RC146, Clinical Sociology, the Philippines Sociological Society, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of the Ateneo de Manila University, the University of Sydney, the University of the Philippines Reservoirs, the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines Project, and CESA University for their support. For the past three decades, APSA has been working to increase academic exchange of sociologists in the Asia-Pacific region, encouraging them to learn and share research results and to understand and overcome social issues. We originally planned to hold the APSA 2020 conference in the Philippines. However, the COVID-19 pandemic makes it difficult for us to meet in person. So APSA executives decided to hold APSA 2020 entirely operate online. COVID-19 continues to spread worldwide it can be seen that socially vulnerable groups have been suffering from societal and serious socio-economic and environmental problems. It is a time that we, sociologists from across the globe, share information and knowledge to consider social issues related to COVID-19 together. Though through the analysis and the interpretation, we can develop the promote international understanding about the effect of COVID-19 on our most vulnerable populations. The APSA 2020 Organizing Committee invite distinguished guest speakers from literally all over the world. We hope to discuss with you to the issues related with COVID-19 from sociological perspective and find fruitful analysis and interpretations. Thank you for your participation. Enjoy the conference and let's learn together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miwako. Now I must welcome you back to introduce today's set of speakers. Now, the day one program is started. The COVID-19 is spreading all over the world and social and ethical issues concerning vulnerable populations have emerged. Such people who are living with illnesses and disabilities, gender and ethnic minorities, low-income household and foreigners have been suffering by huge negative impact of COVID-19. The response of government are different from countries. Also, the impact of health, socioeconomic, and political are different. The APSA organizing committee invite distinguished panelists internationally from Australia, Vietnam, Japan, India, and United Kingdom to discuss such matters. Now, I would like to introduce the first panelist, Dr. Zakia Hussain. She is a demographer and health sociologist and a senior lecturer in the School of Public Health Science at the University of Sydney. Dr. Hussein is the founding secretary of APSA and has contributed to the organization and the conference. So Dr. Zakia, please get started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, probably for some of you. Um, just as a secretary of Asia Pacific Sociology Association and a co-convener of APSA, I would like to welcome all of you in this um, today webinar and also would like to uh, thank uh, panelists um, those who are here across various regions 
um, for your valuable contribution. I would like to thank our uh, speakers, the, uh, uh, get, uh, the speaker like Father Roberto, Dr. Milani Robertson, Professor Jose, Joel, and Emma Polio. Thank you everyone, all the participants as well. I would like to share my screen with the presentation that I'm presenting now. Uh, my talk is about impact of COVID-19 on women in the Asia Pacific region, some sociological perspectives. I'll be looking at uh, globally as of 20, um, 3rd of October, you can see that about 35 million uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 1 million, more than 1 million reported deaths. COVID-19 epidemic has been posing a serious challenge. It started in uh, December last year, like 2019, and it spread um, gradually and it became a serious health threat, health crisis for almost all over the world. It has various impacts and the impacts are we are experiencing all every sphere of our life. I would like to start with a quote, a profound shock to our societies and economies the COVID-19 pandemic underscores society's re resilience on women, both on the front line and at home, while simultaneously exposing structural inequalities across every sphere, from health to economy, security to social protection. As we know that COVID-19 uh, experience is very different and it has uh, all the different regions are experiencing it at a different level in here in the Asia Pacific region and all other regions. You can see that from January that cases were not very much, but gradually you can see that cases, confirmed cases are really high in many uh, countries and many regions. For example, if you can see that Asia, uh, Latin America and North Americans are the ones where we can see that uh, as well as in Europe. I will focus some of these with the uh, India uh, and Bangladesh, few of these uh, Southeast Asian countries are experiencing COVID-19 severely. For example, Bangladesh, Philippines, Pakistan, and Indonesia, India as well. And the death rates also vary more than 10,000 and some countries, but others are experiencing it at a different level. Now, next thing is we know that COVID-19 government and organization international bodies, we are uh, in, in, we have started uh, several different measurements, lockdown, closed and isolation, social, social distancing, using masks and all sorts of things. And it has different impacts as well. And there are other measures that has been also taken uh, that measures are, for example, there are other measures such as affordable healthcare, sickness benefit, unemployment protection, old age support and pro income support and family leave and many more. There are eight other uh, measures that has been taken and different countries in the Asia Pacific region are using, or not every country is, can afford all of them. Many countries, for example, Philippines, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and also we see uh, many other countries, for example, are using uh, most of them, but other countries are not, cannot afford all of them, all measures. Now we look at COVID-19 impacts, as we know that impacts in different regions are different and also in different population groups. And my talk is about the women, uh, women and particularly women, uh, how they're experiencing. The pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities, exposing vulnerabilities in social, political and economic system, which are in turn amplifying the impact of the pandemic. We are looking at women and women's employment and financial situation, Women work in informal sector, as we see that 740 million women are employed in the informal sector, two thirds of them are employed female. And if you look at this uh, employment, uh, because of the lockdown, most of these jobs are, are quickly disappeared. And we also see that because of the closing down the small businesses and some other um, factories and garment industries has, uh, it has a negative, a very huge impact. And most of these garment industries are workers are Bangla, workers are female in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Myanmar, small garment factories witnessing these um, job losses among women. And if we look at the next one is about financial situation women are experiencing during this COVID-19. As we know, women are less, save less and holds less secure job. They have uh, less social protection as well. 
women's domestic workload has gone up and because of the COVID-19, uh, their workload, uh, unpaid care and domestic workload has increased severely. Women are bearing triple burden and, and that is particularly child care and child education and care for the sick. Education is because because of the lockdown, many schools closed and that closure of school is because and children are at home. So women are taking more responsibility of educating children. And we see that 1.5 billion children attending school are, cannot attend because of the COVID-19. And because of that, they are attending school home education and that is provided by women. The other thing about the abuse and domestic violence um, experienced by women, World Health Organization reported that in 2013, about 35% of women uh, of the world are, are subjected to violence by their partners or husbands. More than 80,000 women killed in 2017, and most of them are violated by uh, immediate family members. India is reporting a lot of uh, violence and 600 calls are because of the domestic violence. And during this time, we see many countries are experiencing violence, uh, women experiencing violence. Some of the factors are because of the, they're living in the cramped house, living with the abuse partners and others. There are gender differences in terms of various other activities. You can see that you know, all these income differences and also un unpaid work and caregiving, gender differences are quite clear. And there are some qualitative findings suggesting that we, a girl, for example, in here, quote, a girl staying at home during COVID-19 has, uh, I have more work to do struggling with new study models online. Looking at all these, actually talking about the, how women are experiencing um, various health challenges, various uh, economic financial challenges, psychological distress, the recommendation, policy recommendation, we would like to suggest that there are some support that can be provided to women to overcome the financial crisis, psychological distress, for example, universal basic income, which is a program that has been uh, practiced by various countries. And there it is a successful program and some countries are providing some cash to women so that they can minimize their job loss and also experience minimize their financial crisis. Government commitment is very important. And so we need to see that governments are doing more in terms of uh, improving gender inequality and vulnerability. Education program, for example, virtual program is very important and circular radio. For example, the virtual program is very important that we should avoid violence against women and warn and early detection of uh, early detection of violence and domestic violence to minimize those. And giving, talking about this, how we can do work collaboratively internationally, we need more research. Therefore, we we'll look we'll be looking at a collaboration from participants from the uh, uh, presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Zakia Hossein. Now I welcome back um, Professor Miwako Hosoda to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Zakia. It is such an excellent presentation. So now I'd like to introduce the second panelist, Professor Nian Chen Hong. She is an associate professor and former vice director of Hanoi University of Public Health in Vietnam. She has 30 years of experience in teaching, research, and providing constantly in health policy and management, health promotion. She has been leading and involving in a member of research project of health policy and system health promotion interventions. She has also worked as a national consultant <laughs> for the number of international agencies, too. So now, let us welcome Professor Nguyen Jin Hong. Thank you. To be, hey, Jeff. To be then in uh, this conference, and I am a public health specialist, not social sociologist, but uh, I work a lot in the fields of uh, social determinant of health and health policy. So it is really my pleasure and would like to share with you some uh, 
experience from Vietnam when we fighting with COVID. So I will try to share my screen. Have you? Yeah, hopefully it uh, it work out. Is that okay? Okay. So my presentation focus on how the Vietnamese government respond to COVID-19. And uh, certainly we have some successful now, and, uh, but we have a lot of challenge. So I would like to share with you and to discuss with you how to set uh, success, but very importantly, so to work together to overcome the challenges. So just briefly about Vietnam for no for 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 whom not uh, know very well about our country, but uh, we are a very population uh, populated with nearly hundred million people. Uh, we have quite good life expectancies with uh, nearly seventy four years, and um, our GDP before COVID nineteen two thousand nineteen is uh, increased quite fast and not. I mean, not very high, and we are in the group of lower middle income countries. And our religion is mainly Buddhism, and the politics is one party, this communist party. Um, you know that our country is started, uh, yeah, belong to the lower middle income country in 2010. And since then, the government is uh, really trying to develop <laughs> our social protection system that uh, meet international standards. And you know that the party also have a duration and we try to, by 2020, we try to be basically achieve social security for the whole population. We also ensure minimum, uh, ensure minimum level income, education, housing, clean water and information for our population. And uh, we gradually enhancement of income ensuring security, living, ha uh, living and happiness of the people. And um, very interesting that for several international surveys showing that Vietnamese people is in the uh, list of the top country have a high indicator of happiness. And uh, we have number of policy, uh, public policy and public health policy and program for the children's rights and well being of the youth, women, and aging. And especially in terms of health insurance, we follow the universal health coverage. And at the moment, we cover about nearly 90% of our population. And especially, we have free health insurance card for all children under six and for the poor, and uh, cover 80% for the near poor. And just have a quick look on some example of health policy support for the poor. Over time, we increase the support for this group. And you can see that at the current, we have some kind of uh, uh, free health insurance card. 100% of the poor is have free health insurance cards. And also we have other health policy toward the poor and also the near poor. As I said that, the near poor also have a support for 80% of the money to buy the health insurance card. Since we, uh, our, uh, the world is uh, facing with the uh, COVID-19 ongoing pandemic, Vietnam is not exception. But uh, as you can see, maybe through the, um, um, the, the media, you can see that Vietnam is uh, considered as one of the country have some really success in terms of fighting that uh, ongoing pandemic. And I would like to share with you some kinds of success that we achieved so far. Uh, the first thing we think that we control or curb COVID-19 outbreak with certain social economic development. So you can see that uh, I will give you some figure after this, but at least we are in the group of the country have a good control of the pandemic. We also ensure food security for the population by a number of policy. But uh, one of the example is that we, as a third country export of rice, we monitor rice export closely during, during the COVID to, I mean, support for the, ensure the food security for our population. 
uh, looking at the GDP growth rate, and you can see that during the time of, uh, you can see the figure from the 2011 to 2020 for the second quarter of the year, even the GDP is uh, reduced dramatically for Vietnam, but you can see that it's been positive increase, increasing, and it is 0.36%. Um, and you can see that compared with many countries in the region and in the world, this can see as a positive economic development. And also for international survey recently showing that more than 30% of the participants in Vietnam thinking that Vietnam is doing right amount of the policy and the measure to control of the uh, uh, epidemic. And uh, Vietnam is the highest percentage among the 45 country survey. So here it is just very quick some figure showing uh, so far we uh, we have only 1097 1, today is 97 with a one new case come from uh, fly from dubai and we can say that uh, we no new case in the community after 33 days now so it is really good a uh, simple of how we we go, we prevent and control of the spread of uh, uh, covid and also why we uh, how we do, uh, what kind of response to, of the government to uh, fighting the pandemic. And in the screen, you can see some kind of main measure and very quick response from the government. Uh, the first one is the government demonstrated strong and quite aggressive, very strong responsive in the fight with the pandemic. For example, Vietnam is the first nation after China to put a large residential area in the isolation zone. For example, we isolating infected people and checking down their contracts and community or village where was a risk of the pandemic. And you know that we do it not uh, one time for the whole country, but then we checking the high risk area and close just only the, that area. The other area, we continue with some kind of social economic policy that keep our economic is not reduce, uh, reduction dramatically. And we also stop issue visa for foreigner from infected na nation. And um, at the moment, we starting to provide visa again for special group of people like expert, uh, high skill uh, worker to come to Vietnam with a very careful quarantine to start support for economic development. Uh, we also started uh, suspending all commercial international flight coming from uh, departing from pandemic era as soon as the first case was confirmed, but we starting some kind of commercial uh, fly from some country in the region, as I said, to uh, ensure the development of the economy. For example, we start fly from Korea uh, to start with a lot of uh, economic zone expert to come for continue with working in, uh, for working in Vietnam. We also require all Vietnamese and international visitor who return from abroad to quarantine at Central Life Valley facility for 14 days and for nearly seven months the government pay all the the money for the quarantine regardless they are vietnamese or international people but at the moment from the first of september we start taking some fee from the people they would like to come to work for vietnam and some people to visit vietnam as well and we also have some kind of financial support and tech delay for vulnerable group that helping them to uh, overcome the, the, the problem during the COVID-19. And in terms of how we con uh, containment, um, apply containment measure to control the spread of uh, COVID-19, and you can see in the screen is that we do very strictly contact tracing. We have the uh, uh, infect, uh, with the infection 
prevention and control in healthcare setting. And this is very strictly because we have a lesson learned during the second wave in Vietnam, which cost nearly 35 lives because of the COVID-19 spread in the emergency and some department in the some hospital in the center. So now we apply very strictly infection prevention and con uh, prevention and control in health setting. And go also we have a targeted lockdown, not the whole country, but some area. And also we have a mass gathering, traveling and mobility restriction. And very importantly, we have a very clear, consistent and creative public health message. And maybe you can know that we have a very famous uh, sing uh, the 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 uh, the sing the song that uh, right from the beginning of the COVID nineteen that is again COVID and it is a broadcasted as a very good example in CNA. Also, we do very good contract uh, contact tracing with the uh, third degree, uh, degree contract. A contact and uh, quickly you can see that we are not only following, following one level but we following the third level and the diagram here showing uh, to to use how we contract so it is the third level is this one from the first the second the third and even for some error we also continue to following the other one so with that kind of uh, of contact tracing Third, uh, third degree con uh, contract tracing, we have a very good to measure to contain the spread of the epidemic. So now I would like to share with you some lessons learned from Vietnam that we documented and uh, we also maybe other country can look at and see whether we do the same or different and we share experience, uh, experience uh, to each other. The first one is a very good investment in the public health infrastructure uh, and that would enable our country to have a, hard, a, his, um, a head start in managing public health crisis effectively. The second is early action uh, from government and the community ranging from the broader closure to testing to lockdown and club community spread before to our contact tracing as i mentioned also very good measure and experience quarantine beyond the possi possible expo uh, exposure rather than symptom only also can reduce a systematic uh, system uh, systematic uh, sy symptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission and clear communication is crucial clear, consistent, serious narrative, and also uh, very uh, dissemination of the message. And finally, but uh, not but not, not, not last but not least, but also very important from the social, uh, social perspective is that we have a very strong whole of the society approach and engage of multi-sectoral stakeholder in decision-making process and very activate a cohesive participation from different uh, stakeholders, especially from the community, from the grassroots level to support the government. Uh, apart from that, we also have some lessons that very typical for Vietnam and maybe not replicate in other countries, but it might contribute to the success of uh, Vietnam. That is, we, we have some experience with the past of ep ep epidemic because Vietnam is a country we um, have to combat uh, with the Professor Nguyen, this yes. is to let you know to please wrap yes. up your presentation. Yeah. And uh, we also, uh, some lesson, and we also have a uh, the party that is actually very important to direct from the uh, top to the down. And finally, I just have a uh, slide to share with uh, you some rapid analysis of social challenges. And it is may, it may be similar, but uh, uh, different with other country. But I see that it's quite similar with the presentation from Zakia, where we have a lot of challenge. Women, vulnerable, vulnerable group, ethnic group that uh, actually have a lot of uh, impact and big impact on the pandemic. 
So that's uh, all of my presentation related to the success and also challenge from the combating COVID-19 in Vietnam. Okay, so thank you very much for your addition. I am uh, and I am happy to share with you and discuss later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Hong. Um, this is to remind all panelists that um, each presentation should stay within 10 minutes. Thank you very much. I now welcome back Prof. Mewako to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Ina. And thank you very much, Professor Nien Tien It is very inspiring presentation. So next speaker, I'd like to introduce Professor Kaori Muto. Kaori Muto is Professor of the Department of Public Policy, Human Genome Center in the University of Tokyo. She has been working in the field of biomedical ethics and medical sociology. Her involvement, uh, her research interests include ethical, legal, and social impl implication and patient and public involvement. She has also served as a member of expert meeting for COVID-19 in the government of Japan. So let us now welcome Professor Kaori Muto. Hi, um, thank, you very much for, thank you very much for inviting me to APSA 2020 webinar. And I would like to uh, thank you, Zakia, Miyako, Emma, and Ina, and other colleagues. Thank you so much. And I am a medical sociologist working in Tokyo. And I would like to talk about mainly the roles of experts in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, let me begin by sharing the latest numbers of COVID-19 in Japan. Japan has a population uh, about 126 million. And as of October 5th, um, the total number of active cases was um, 85,000 uh, and the 1,597 uh, 1, deaths has been reported. And there were um, almost um, 80,000 recovered cases. And the figure on the left indicates reported active cases. And between April 7th to and May uh, May 20, I think 21st, um, the Japanese government declared the state of emergency. And now we are standing at the point of so-called the end of uh, second wave of this summer or uh, at the beginning of the third wave uh, for this winter. And the figure on the right shows the total death by a uh, logarithmic scale. And you can see the trend line was very steep uh, this spring, but recently it seems to be relatively stable. As a country, Japan did not experience SARS or MERS, uh, so we did not learn from those experiences. However, in spite of our devastatingly poor capacity for testing people each day at a rate only one fifth of the South Korea last spring, the total number of deaths didn't rise. This figure shows our organization chart for the government COVID-19 response during the first six months of the pandemic. And I'd like to show two laws. These two laws played important roles. Uh, the first is the Special Measures Act. And under the Article 31 of this act, the government declared a one month long state of emergency related to COVID-19 outbreak. The area was limited to uh, seven prefectures and the government finally expanded to all areas in Japan. The measures such as restricting the use of large facilities to prevent people from gathering became possible under the terms of the law in response to this pandemic. However, this act does not have power to enforce people to obey countermeasures. So we can just um, ask them or request them to cooperate. 
And another act is the uh, Act on the Prevention of Infectious Disease. And uh, uh, this law uh, classify infectious diseases into eight categories based on their levels of contagiousness, seriousness of the symptoms, and types of disease. In the case of new disease, officials may recommend that a person who is suspected uh, of being infected receive a medical examination and mandatory hospitalization. And I was attend, uh, assigned to attend the expert meeting for COVID-19 to give advice from a medical expert's perspective on COVID-19 countermeasures. And then this expert meeting uh, was an ad hoc advisory committee answerable to the government. And it was established to provide advice and suggestions. And I, uh, I am a sociologist so that I cannot give any medical advice, but try to advise on ethical, social implications and risk communication. And we have held discussions almost 24 seven since February 14th and have recommended to the government. And the, the, these are the three pillars of COVID-19 response strategy in Japan. And a significant COVID-19 cluster is declared when there are 10 or more connected through transmission from a single site among people who are not all a part of the same household. And clusters include both confirmed and probable cases. And with strong support from public health centers, we could trace them retrospectively and recommend them to close contact to isolate. And we also published uh, several situation reports. Um, on February, February 24th, the first perspective report characterizes that the high risk environment on COVID-19. And we had to have these three pillars approach only because the capacity for testing and intensive care units were devastatingly poor in the early phases of the pandemic. And we had to think, uh, we had to ask the public to prepare for standard precautions to support hospitals and to save hospital professionals and save the uh, elderly people and also people with pre-existing conditions who are most vulnerable to COVID-19. And fortunately, people were very cooperative in Japan. And according to our survey, the most important event influencing these precautionary actions uh, was the infection aboard the Diamond Princess cruise ship, uh, which occurred in early February 2020. And in addition to standard precautions, the three C's concept for raising awareness of high risk environment has been widely used in COVID-19 prevention campaign and not only in Japan, but also by WHO. And to date, the expert meeting has published three perspectives papers and 12 situation reports and recommendations. And every time after we had official meeting, we revised the draft in a few hours and held a press conference that lasted more than two hours. And and uh, the public was informed and updated on the situation in a timely manner. And on July 3, uh, 3rd, uh, the cabinet disbanded expert meeting and established a new subcommittee. And uh, this is a, a current organization chart. And now I am working on the prejudice, discrimination and privacy and protection. And um, I think uh, many people are really afraid of these about broader societal issues. And I'd like to um, suggest three things. Um, first of all, there are so many uh, defamation and discrimination against some groups, both online and offline. And healthcare professionals and care workers are very, very much, uh, very criticized due to uh, nosocom nosocom uh, nosocomial infections. And uh, I think also, uh, employees at the club, which provides male companions to female patrons, are also criticized in Japan and stigmatized due to um, their virus uh, was uh, origin of the second wave. And I'm very cautious about the next targets in this winter. And second, um, building trust and cooperation for COVID-19 responses for people uh, working at the places of the higher risk 
is quite important in Japan right now. Um, and thirdly, prolonged prohibition of visits to hospital and social care institution. Uh, we asked them to do this, but um, however, efforts to prioritize the long-term prevention of COVID-19 have put various pressures on the quality of life of other vulnerable populations. And uh, I'm very afraid of the breach of the privacy. And these are the, uh, from the newspapers and, and newspaper reporters um, wrote the cluster map or correlation diagram reported. Uh, and they, uh, these are really, uh, I think it's really dangerous and the breach of privacy. And I asked them to not to do this again. And uh, fourth, uh, we have observed disparities in long-term risk perception. And some people are really afraid of COVID-19 and act very carefully. And their actions are sometimes offensive to others. And also, uh, in addition to uh, the, these things, stay in place orders, school closures, and curfews are very burdensome to women. So we want to um, collaborate together, and uh, I, we want to um, challenge the new good society in uh, Pacific and Asia area. So thank you very much. These are my colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof. Uh, Kauri. Now um, I invite back Professor Miwako to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kauri Muto. I'm really sorry you have very you know short time for it, but it was very yeah excellent and informative. So I just like to welcome the third presenter. Uh, professor Mohammed Akram. He's a professor of sociology at Arga Muslim University in India. He's interested in the field of sociology of health, sanitation, education, and social policies. He is the main convener of the research committee 12 Population, Health, and Society of Indian Sociological Society for four years. So now, let us welcome Professor Muhammad Akram. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me for this uh, very uh, academic and timely conference. And uh, uh, I would like to thank my previous presenters for presenting two uh, beautiful cases, uh, Vietnam and Japan, who have very successfully handled the COVID-19 situation. Zakia was talking about uh, the other uh, side of the problem, basically related to several other countries. And she was highlighting the problem related to women. Uh, my presentation, basically COVID-19 and lockdown, abrupt measures and never ending social miseries. Uh, perhaps I'm not going to present such a positive uh, handling of the situation, uh, maybe something uh, not so great about the phenomenon. But uh, one thing I must uh, share at the beginning that uh, very often we mix up the cases, uh, the situations related to COVID-19 and then the situations which were, uh, which, which came into existence because of the uh, combat measures or the lockdown kind of situation. So for me, uh, the biggest situation was uh, the biggest problem was to situate the problem. And uh, I have used actually uh, two different situations to understand the, the situation or the perspective, to develop the perspective. And uh, should we focus on consequences which are related to premature mortality, spread of morbidity, and unseen and seen disabilities of known and unknown types, or the socioeconomic and political cultural consequences caused because of the pandemic? So one thing is the health related consequences and second thing is the socioeconomic consequences. Uh, do we need to look at these things at one point of time or separately? That is the first problem. Second one is this, are the consequences caused because of the spread of COVID-19 the only concern or the consequences of the abrupt measures adapted to combat the pandemic also need to be assessed. And the second situation is this, whether the pandemic is the only problem or the, the, the lockdown is again a problem. And uh, basically in India, we 
realize that that the second aspect of the problem is equally important and for that basically i have presented here the situations related to lockdown here uh, although the first case was detected in the month of january the first phase of lockdown was implemented in the month of march and we had four different phases 25th march to 14th of april 15th of april to 3rd of may then 14th to 17th of may and 18th to 31st of may and then uh, these were the periods of complete nationwide lockdown almost complete now in india basically we are we are a 1.3 billion population it's a federal structure the more than 25 states and union territories and a huge uh, uh, country we are the largest democracy and then uh, nationwide i mean you can imagine the situations related to nationwide lockdown and then the unlock basically are uh, nothing but the partial lockdowns so uh, the first phase was almost like a lockdown and then this is the fifth month of unlock that means in india we have witnessed situations related to lockdown right from the month of march till now so this is a very uh, huge problem so as i stated that i have tried to see the problem in two different situations one is the health related and the socio cultural consequences and then the problem as a covid 19 as one problem and the, the the phase of lockdown and unlock as another problem so four different situations are actually coming into existence but when i'm talking about this lockdown and covid 19 we do need to have some kind of understanding of the numbers because the numbers are important and uh, as it was uh, told that in vietnam already the cases have been uh, controlled in india basically when we had the first phase of lockdown there were 10 deaths on 25th of till 25th of march there were only 10 deaths and the total number of cases were 606 and when we had the uh, end of the fourth phase of lockdown there were 5164 mortalities and 182000 cases and as of today basically uh, 30th of september 30th of september uh, it was i mean 6 million so what has happened that that the cases kept on increasing despite the lockdowns and this continuous increase in the cases and the mortalities kept on damaging the social structure of the society so the problems are actually health related as well as socio cultural and we need to understand uh i try to uh, take into consideration multiple dimensions of the problem so if we see who got affected because of the health related consequences we identify three groups of persons infected persons who got directly uh, infected then the family members and then the care providers the frontline workers and very pathetic situation this is that actually all the three groups of person witnessed mortalities and morbidities and not only that basically mental and social health problems and then the heart and brain strokes so severe health problems basically emerged and not only among those who got infected but also those who were the family members or those who were the frontline workers and then this created another situation basically i would like to highlight one thing the weak and vulnerable people got for the weekend basically all those weak and vulnerable i i mean uh, the, the, those who were already sick those who were already uh, suffering from comorbidity or those who were the aged population so there were uh, further uh, uh, severe impact on their health situation then second situation is this that the health related consequences caused because of abrupt and unplanned lockdown now this is no less severe than the first situation and uh, in the month of april basically in india all the newspaper and the basically the print media were were having all those reports and many among you are uh, familiar with these things people dead in road accidents and railway tracks then death of children and other during the travels then death of people in lack of food and supplies then serious patients basically who were unable to get health facilities in the hospitals then the mental health hunger and this lack of immunization to of children because of the closure of the hospitals so increased death morbidity and disability 
from preventable situations, but because of this lockdown, we witnessed all these things. Then comes the second important part, that the socio-cultural impact. Now, this is very important. I'm a student of sociology. I need to talk about these things. Basically, what happened that uh, because of the communicable nature and because of the kind of problem, the social distancing and the problem of untouchability that was prevailing in this part of the world, some kind of stigma actually came into existence. This stigma, this physical distancing got somehow converted into some kind of uh, uh, untouchability sort of thing. And the stigma and discrimination and social isolation came into existence. Now, there is a situation of triple victimization. Now, as a student of sociology, we need to understand the self and the society, person who got affected, they got victimized by themselves and the society. But unfortunately, what happened that in certain cases, the state also became one uh, agency which created some kind of victimization. And then in this whole situation, actually, class, gender, religion, caste, and age became inequality multiplier and deprivation multiplier. Now, this is a very typical situation when all these agencies or situations become deprivation multiplier. And then we now come to the other situation, the socio-cultural and political economic consequences caused because of the abrupt and unplanned lockdown. Now, more than 10 million people actually in the organized sector and 100 million people in the unorganized sector, almost as per different reports, lost their jobs. Absolute situation of resourcelessness. People who migrated from larger cities like Delhi, Mumbai, they are jobless. Then increased marginalization of the unemployed people, sick people, disabled and children, and then increased domestic violence. Again, gender, caste, religion, and age became inequality and deprivation multiplier. So basically now we are witnessing a kind of situation which uh, uh, perhaps India has never seen before. So all these things have created the never ending social business. Uh, just uh, half half a minute, I will take return of communicable and infectious disease has it's a challenge for the uh, epidemiologist world over. We are are we moving towards a sick society? Then the way the social fabric is actually getting affected is another concern. So what is happening that health is creating. Uh, a different kind of challenge and the, the policy making and governance is creating a different kind of challenge. So uh, if we go by the experiences shared in this part of the world, we see that the world is, 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 is about to face a severe challenge and we need to be uh, more empowered. We need to be prepared for social and civil empowerment. So thank you very much. Uh, I think there are a few things which I could not explain, but I will certainly take up uh, during the question hour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Akram, for that um, presentation. Now I um, welcome back Professor Miwako to let us know about our next speaker. Thank you, Ina, and thank you, Professor Akram. Yeah, it was a really um, yeah, wonderful presentation. We learned a lot from your talk. So I'd like to introduce the last panelist. Professor Mike Sachs. Mike Sachs is Emeritus Professor at the University of Suffolk and Visiting Professor at the University of Lincoln, the Royal Veterinary College, University of London, and the University of Westminster, United Kingdom, as well as the University of Toronto, Canada. His work span the social science from political and social policy to his base discipline of sociology. He's a past president of the International Sociological Association Research Committee on Professional Group and is now vice president of ISA Research Committee on Health. So now I would like to introduce uh, welcome, we have like to welcome Dr. Sachs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mawako. Um, I'll just uh, get my uh, slides loaded up. 
having a few problems here just uh, connecting i don't know whether you might be able to help me to put my slides up oh that's fantastic thank you so much right excellent brilliant thank you for that so i want to talk about the health policy response to covid19 in england and um after the effective uh, um uh, the effective introduction by Mawaka. I don't think we need to linger very much on the next slide. If you could just put me onto the next slide, please. Lovely. Um, I'm just basically reiterate some of the things that Mawaka has said. And I just wanted to say that I'm really speaking from a sociological perspective, but I have worked sort of in across disciplines uh, all of my life, really, in many ways. Um, if you would just go back to the previous slide, that will be helpful. Um, and um, basically, I also work with governments, so government advisor, I also advise um, internationally. And um, if we could go on to the next slide, please, beyond my personal profile. Yeah, my, so that's my experience. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so anyway, so we've heard that the COVID-19 pandemic is sweeping the world. And uh, there are now over 1 million deaths and 34 million cases globally, which is a terrible statistic. Um, and countries have made many res different responses to this. And I've been really um, kind of struck with the difference between what has happened in Vietnam and what has happened in Japan and what is happening in, the, in, the, in England and the UK generally, because we've really moved um, to quite a high level of uh, cases um, here. So um, we've had hundreds of daily deaths in the first wave um, and um, many thousands of cases every day. And we're now into a second wave, which is occurring with um, over 7,000 positive cases and 60 or more deaths per day just a few days ago. And I'm gonna say something about that. And we've switched policy from you know, herd immunity to full lockdown, which has uh, obviously affected some countries as well. So we've seen all shades of position. Next slide, please. Thanks. So this sort of indicates the kind of entry into the second wave. But what I want to say, which hasn't been mentioned so far, is that um, there are huge issues about the interpretation of statistics. Because although we seem only to have had six or 7,000 cases back in April and March, um, the estimate now is that there were in fact 100,000 cases um, of uh, coronavirus, um, but they simply weren't recorded because a rigorous testing regime wasn't in position. And so even though now um, the steady state has moved towards 7,000, um, we, we actually are much better off than we were in the first wave um, in terms of cases. Um, but what I would say is that um, just today, the government announced that there has been a shortfall in recording the number of cases. And so now the estimate for yesterday, yesterday's number of cases has leapt up to 23,000, which is just, you know, I mean, incredible really. And so I don't quite know where it's going to go. And so I'd like, I am a little bit critical of the government. So I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Thank you. And I just want to say that the government policy has been quite severely criticized in England and although it may be worse in other situations in terms of policy, as we've heard, for example, maybe in India as well, um, I think that there was a very late response to the initial wave and a weak response to the second wave of, um, of cases. And government personnel weren't always setting a good example. They didn't have action taken against them, including the prime minister's top advisor who had COVID-19 and drove up to the north 200 miles with COVID-19. 19 during lockdown, which wasn't a good idea. We've had delayed and in inadequate testing and tracing arrangements. Um, I mean, just recently, um, I, it was indicated to me that if I wanted to get a test, I'd need to go drive some 150 or 200 miles to, to a testing station. And this is seven months in. Um, we've had insufficient personal protective equipment, including particularly in care homes where COVID-19 has, has run wild. We've had poorly monitored and slow implementation of travel restrictions. We heard that they are have been very stringent in um, Vietnam, for example. That's been very far from the case in, in England. And we've had very confusing advice. Should we wear face masks or should we not? 
seem to be more linked to the availability of face masks rather than the science behind it. And um, there has been um, orders for people, you know, where you've got to get your employees back to work, um, but given very short notice in terms of introducing COVID-19 safe measures, which is not so good. So next slide, please. Um, so some of the reasons for the poor government response to COVID-19, they're very varied. I mean, some of them are, you know, in any country, you're going to have this left field development where there are going to be unknowns, mistakes are going to be made. It's pretty inevitable. But there have been major supply chain issues as well, um, particularly in terms of the delivery of PPE, as we call it, um, from outside England. Um, but the government has been quite desirous to protect individual liberty in a democratic society and so has been reluctant to actually impose top-down um, solutions. Uh, but there has been a lot of incompetence which has been evident in the government leadership team and the government has lost a lot of trust in terms of where it's going. And um, I think another factor that's come into the equation that hasn't been strongly mentioned is that there is a need to actually balance the fight against COVID-19 with the functioning of the economy, because the dip in the economy can actually cause more serious health issues than COVID-19 itself. And here we're talking in England about a dip in performance, which has probably been much stronger than, you know, than the years going back to the 1920s and the Great Depression. Next slide, please. Um, but from a sociological viewpoint, I think that um, the effects of government policy on coronavirus has been really manifold. Um, one of the issues has been um, that obviously because of some of the issues about the um, speed of getting a grip on COVID-19 um, and um, other um, issues to do with the infrastructure and uh, the equipment um, issues, uh, where we have seen um, COVID-19 run wild, there has been greater morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 than strictly necessary. And we need to realize here that we look at deaths as an indicator, but there's some pretty horrific effects, long-term chronic effects from COVID-19, which we should be very aware of. Um, the, and this is even amongst young people who are at least well affected, um, at least badly affected. And we also have seen um, considerable widening inequalities for the aged as compared with the young and for black, particularly black ethnic minorities who have been the most adversely affected uh, groups from a health perspective. Um, so we found that um, certainly in England, there have been a larger proportion of deaths amongst those who have contracted COVID-19 amongst um, black ethnic minorities. Um, and of course, the elderly have been disadvantaged in two ways. One has been, one has been um, from um, having to shield, because the governments have told them essentially to stay at home for the first six months um, to uh, protect themselves, um, which has obviously led to social deprivation. We've also seen the ramifications of unemployment and precarity, because unemployment and precarity have both risen quite steeply. Uh, with all the implications that they carry for ill health. And we've seen a great negative impact on the digitally disadvantaged at all levels of education, um, schools, colleges and universities. So those people who don't have PCs or who have um, antiquated PCs are definitely at a major disadvantage um, in terms of the way the government and institutions have approached this in terms of online learning. And there has also been um, a tremendous conflict which has, been, uh, which has occurred between the aged and the uh, younger generation over public health rules. And this has led to some perverse stigmatization of younger people. You know, it hasn't quite been um, people who are in the front line who are dealing uh, regularly with um, COVID who've been majorly affected. So um, basically, if we go on to uh, next slide, please. Um, if anything, those who have been at the front line have been um, fated and lauded um, by the general public. Um, but I would like to just make one point at the uh, close of this presentation, and that is that the um, effects that have um, really been amplified by the government insisting that they're following clinical scientific advice. 
And in a way, it's appeared to people in the in England and the UK generally, that this is a kind of smokescreen for its own failures. It's kind of passing the buck because um, there are intense disagreements among clinical scientists about aspects of the policy. And um, it really does deflect attention away from the fact that politics has played quite a significant part in setting the policy course, which has not been wonderful for, the, for England. And uh, I just want to say too that um, social scientists were relatively marginalized in the policy process. And this has led to the amplification of some of the debilitating effects of the pandemic through, for example, the lack of awareness of the mental health implications of social isolation and neglecting the disruption of familial support through social distancing. I was very struck by Zakia's comments originally about um, domestic violence. And we've seen similar rises in domestic violence, particularly against women in, the, in England, um, which I would highlight. And um, also there has been a failure, I think, by some members of the public to understand the more carefree reaction of youth to COVID-19 and to get into a kind of blame culture about unruly behavior, which um, perhaps, you know, it may, may not be good for people who are vulnerable, but it is uh, understandable and one can have some empathy. So next and final slide, please. Um, the conclusion, I just wanted to highlight the shortcomings of government health policy in England in relation to COVID-19 and the factors that have shaped it. I've also endeavored to show the negative social effects that have emerged in consequence of this policy and finally, I wanted to really underline how important it is to have sociologists and other social scientists, we say, inside the tent alongside clinical scientists in the health policy formation in response to the pandemic. It's very important that we all work together. And I just have um, a couple more slides. One is just um, the references that I've um, drawn on amongst others. I will particularly recommend the Michael Kalnan article on health policy and controlling COVID-19 in England, which is really excellent sociological insights, which came out relatively recently. And of course, some of the other items which are listed. And just go to the final slide. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to be invited. And I hope that um, I've added another dimension to the mosaic which um, one can see globally uh, uh, in relation to COVID-19. So um, thank you very much. And let's look forward to a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike Sachs. So now uh, we uh, have a great uh, the talk from the all panelists. I truly appreciate all the panelists for the presentation. And also, I would like to thank you for all audience. Actually, we have a lot of questions and comment. So now, uh, the uh, we ask the, some questions from the audience. So I have a question from Mark Nero Vernes to all panelists. So what? Do you consider as the biggest mistake leaders in the world have made in response to COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, it might be a big question. So, so we hear um, a lot of strategy and operation of the government and, and the society. So who want to respond to this question. What do you consider as the biggest mistake leaders in the world have made in response to COVID-19 pandemic? So, in during the, uh, the presentation, Vietnam, Vietnam, you know, was successful, have been successful operating to respond to the COVID-19 disaster. But some other country, like uh, maybe Japan, India, United Kingdom, maybe you have some comment. 
Yeah, well, I'm I'm happy to uh, to open up. Thank you very uh, much. So, Mike, please. Like, uh, Mark, uh, I mean, I think that the biggest mistake any leader can make in relation to COVID-19 is to do nothing. And I think we have seen um, some situations where that has happened. Uh, we I mentioned in my presentation the delays in England in actually, you know, getting a control of travel into the UK, for example. Um, and monitoring the, the people who are entering the UK for COVID-19, that's one aspect of it. Um, but, uh, but I think that um, there have also been um, situations um, where, um, like in Brazil, for example, where the, where the president has sort of stood back, as it were. And uh, I think that has been extremely worrying for the, for the wider population without necessarily treating COVID-19 with the respect it deserves. Um, but I, I do think that it's a, it's a really complex issue because one of the things that we found in, um, in the UK is that when we've had extreme lockdown, um, that in a way um, that has been beneficial in fighting COVID-19. But on the other hand, it has meant that some other people who have got very serious diseases like cancer and so on, have been neglected because the government has been making room for in the hospitals for all the COVID-19 patients. And uh, one of the results of this is that um, is a lot of people have been dying because they haven't been able to get the treatment they needed from even our you know, otherwise excellent um, National Health Service. So you can look in a variety of directions, I think, in response to this very good question that's been asked. Thank you very much. So how about uh, think, how about uh, Akram, Professor Akram yes, Mohammed? Do yes, you have yes, some yes, comment? Uh, I would like to say a few things. Basically, uh, this, this is a very I mean uh, important question, and I think it, it will take time to understand a proper answer. That what mistake the leaders of the world made, and we should start thinking in terms of this. But I think two or three mistakes we can identify as of now. The first thing is this, that we had a segregated approach globally. Actually, although we have global institutions like the UN or for that matter, WHO, but the role of WHO for, uh, I mean, several reasons remain under question right from the very beginning and the global platform that we should have created to respond to the pandemic that went missing right from the very beginning. So what the world would have taken, actually uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, there should have been some kind of uh, uh, a representative or coordinated group should have come into existence because the impact is different actually. If, if, you, if you see the Northern Hemisphere, Northern sphere and the Southern sphere, the impact of COVID-19 is very different. So what happened in India, basically as of today, now we are the biggest uh, uh, number in terms of COVID affected people. What happened here that we somehow got influenced by the response of COVID-19 in uh, Europe or you say in US, but the response was actually quite different in India or for that matter in this whole uh, sub region. So had there been more coordinated effort, perhaps the damage could have been controlled. That is one point. The second point that I have highlighted in my presentation that more than COVID-19, actually the, 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 the measures taken to combat COVID-19 have damaged country like India. No, we, we have the GDP negative growth. I mean, that too, in the in the range of minus 23 to 24. So th this economic cost could have been minimized had there been a better coordinated effort, even in the national context. Now, what happened in India, actually? Uh, we could have had a group of experts. And here... We should have taken help from the social sciences. Now, the second biggest mistake that the world has actually uh, witnessed is this, that the role of the social scientists have been underestimated. Now, at, the, at a later stage, we are making our points, but at that point of time, uh, perhaps the social scientists were not consulted the way they should have been, because epidemics is, are the social situations. 
and we need to understand we need to make a social assessment of the whole situation so uh, these things uh, we should have taken care of and third thing that is a very important that i would like to personally highlight that this is not something related to the covid 19 but this is related to the larger uh, context that we have been depending too much on the medical care system actually and the over dependence and you can say over medicalization has created us i mean have made us hollow the immune system is weakened so this covid 19 is really uh, an alarming situation for all of us but we need to take care of the personal hygiene dietary habits and health and the immune system because the immune system is very important whether it is for the human beings or whether it is for the larger society so this okay, covid thank you very system, much yeah yes, thank sir. you very much yes it is very important to take uh, uh, the social aspect and uh, it on this matters so uh, the same question the, the can i ask the professor kauri uh, what do the cons do you consider as the biggest mistake leader in the world right uh, yeah um this is a very good question and uh, this is related to the frank's question Uh, next one yeah can social protection and economic protection mechanism happen in parallel we need to be faced with one taking priority over the other um in my understanding um i think the biggest mistake is the lack of sharing the core value to combat covid-19 um i'm sorry i didn't show you my video um the the biggest uh, mistake is the lack of the sharing the core, core value to combat covid-19 and some leader just imposed their idea to the public and in case of japan uh, in my understanding the um, ex prime minister didn't show his attitude clearly and so that the uh, professional experts committee was criticized uh, from the media uh, because uh, one uh, professor said that uh, the government and the expert panel had failed to clearly define their roles which left to the panel and take the brunt of any criticism and i could understand these points um if we were not in the middle of pandemic but however i'm still wondering what the desirable roles uh, of the public health experts during the pandemic uh, are, and particularly uh, the role between the um, politicians and the experts. So that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, maybe Zakia, uh, Professor Zakia, you have something to respond? Question. Yeah, this is a very good question, and the issues that I have covered has got a lot of things to do with the social and economic crisis that women are experiencing, and it's not only the women; the other vulnerable groups are also experiencing. So we need to see that um, the COVID nineteen, when you look at all the measures, particularly the lockdown, and how it impacts on the economic uh, situation. and loss of job and and that can contribute to the um you know uh, more other social issues for example in the in the family environment at the work you know home environment domestic environment how this can contribute so there is a need for looking into that all the measures that we have been taking and dr akram mentioned something to do with the how or we are looking at the health issues and not looking into very much about the social issues that is contributing because of the health and yes we need to look at how policy makers and um, you know planners uh, working together like economic sector we are looking at that we are looking at the covid-19 and the lockdown situation need to think about how we can minimize the impact in the social and economic sphere economic sphere is uh, quite clear but in terms of its impact on the social life its impact on women's life at, at the again it's not only the women the family the children they are also affected and it's a community issues as well so we need to see that some sort of uh, policies are there to protect uh, this sort of environment to minimize this sort of 
situation. I think I tried to explain that uh, the, there is a short term uh, financial support can be provided, but at the same time, we need to increase awareness about the uh, violence situation, how to minimize that, what to report, who, who can help. That, that sort of information should come to the community, to the family, and that can be done as a vi viral, you know, like a radio program and some of the other media so that we can target uh, people who are at risk, target the family, target the women who are at risk and disseminate this information. So the, the work can be done at the same time. So we cannot say like we should look at only the economic um, the, uh, policies and protect the financial situation. It has other implications. So we need to see how social and uh, you know family affairs and, uh, and policymakers are working together to minimize these sort of impacts. That's, I think it, they can work together. It's not that they should be working, protection should be you know, doing fast and then social, it should be worked together. Thank you very much, Zakia. So, so Nick, maybe we'll move to next uh, the questions. Mm -hmm. So the next one to all is the all presenters highlight prevent issues regarding the handling of the COVID-19 health crisis. How do you suppose our society move forward both during and post COVID-19 to elevate and address these issues? So do you have any comment? So how do you suppose our society move forward both during and post COVID situation, like a new normal or something else. Uh, Professor Nguyen Ting, so yeah. in Vietnam, you have successfully operated and managed the COVID 19, so you have some implication. Yeah. Thank you for the question. It is a very good question, but uh, it is a very big one. And uh, I just, I cannot say for the whole world, but I can say about some experience from uh, uh, Vietnam that uh, actually we try to be, have a lot. Can you show the question again to, so that I can, uh, I can see very clearly the question? Can you solve the question again? And yeah, sorry. So yeah, yeah. So do you? So what do you think yeah. of a society move forward? What what is necessary, or what yeah. is your image yes. of the society to move after or COVID nineteen? Yeah. I, I can say for just now during the COVID-19 uh, that uh, Vietnam is a applied number of uh, policy for uh, trying to move forward during the COVID-19 because all saying that we cannot know when the COVID-19 will be stopped and the projection is that maybe 2021 or something like that. Uh, so in Vietnam, we try to be uh, like working collabor uh, collaboration between different kind of scientists, as you all mentioned, we cannot too focus on medical approach, but we have to work with so uh, so um, public health science um, scientists, uh, sociologists, um, like uh, anthropologists, and also medical doctor, and also politics, and even GSO uh, uh, civil society to agree on some kind of policy. So for example, we apply the policy that try to be tracing and not lock down all the countries and try to tracing as early as possible so that we have specific policy for different kinds of community, different kind of area. So that we, in the one side, we think a control of the transmission of the COVID, but in other side, that other area is continue what we call new normal. 
That means that a lot of activity for economic developments and education and uh, etc. traveling is still continue. So that's why Vietnam is now we still have quite normal in the new situation. So we feel quite comfort uh, comfortable at the moment. But at the same time, a lot of strict measure in terms of the intervention from medical perspective still apply. Um, washing their hand, not um, not convene with many people, and big event have to be very carefully controlled which one will be and which one not, etc. Uh, post COVID, I mean it is not easy, but I guess we have to be very carefully watch the situation continue, and also try to be prior, uh, prioritized for some kind of uh, vulnerable group because they are the most affected and try to have some kind of social protection system that encourage them to have a normal life and also to help them to join the economic um, activity. Thank you very much. It is very informative and uh, yeah, uh, we learn a lot from you talk and also uh, there are so, uh, some other questions related on the social discrimination and stigma and professor Muto and professor Akram you were talking about the uh, the the patient or or the, the positive case of the people have uh, uh, severe discrimination and so some we have uh, some question to the uh, the Akram, the how the state become the agent of victimization, or um, what is the uh, could you please uh, answer it yeah. in terms of the stigma or social discrimination. Thank you, Professor Miwako. And yes, there are a few questions. Uh, I would like to respond to them one by one. First, there is a question uh, which was appearing on the screen that uh, economic growth and social, basically social protection and economic protection, should they go side by side or one after the another? Basically, this is a, a very a settled debate. And we are talking about uh, the economic growth model or social development model. And uh, student of sociology, basically students of economics, uh, we were, know that the economic growth model is not a very successful model as of today. And we need to go for the social development model, which talks about social protection along with economic protection. So side by side, instead of waiting for that one thing should take place, and then we will go for, basically, uh, we need to go for both the things side by side. And this is known as inclusive approach inclusive growth so economic protection side by side social protection should be there that is the answer to first question second question basically uh, uh, that, that is a, a general question that uh, how did government uh, become an agent of victimization uh, now this question is uh, rather it is asked to me see if we if we go by the experiences in india several things happened and basically i tried to highlight but the the, the, the larger the, the larger problem are situated not in the domain of covid 19 but because of the the kind of uh, lockdown and the kind of measures which were adopted by the government and the society to protect the society and the state from the impact of lockdown so three things i would like to talk about the first thing is this that in the last week of march uh, all of a sudden, decision was taken by the leadership, the political leadership, to go for a nationwide lockdown. Now, a nationwide lockdown in a country which is having more than uh, 1.3 billion population is a very big decision. And it cannot be taken overnight. Maybe at that point of time, nobody was having that kind of experience. So maybe, uh, it's, but it is a gross uh, sort of thing. Then, so it created uncertainty and confusion. Now, this was 
not fair on the part of the decision makers or policy makers second thing is this that the on unorganized sector actually could not handle the situation very well or i must say that the the, the government didn't plan well as to how to handle the unorganized sector let me share with you in india uh, almost 92 to 94% of the uh, employment opportunities are located within the unorganized sector 93% of the employment is located within the unorganized sector it's a huge sector and then uh, migrant workers then construction workers then uh, unorganized sector workers and agriculture worker but there is a migrate migrates migration migration of people from one part of the country to another part of the country so what happened that all of a sudden trains stop buses stop nationwide lockdown confusion prevailed people started to move from one place to another, another place walking and then this has created a huge uh, 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 disturbance basically mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of people dead or uh, did during their travels and all those oh, things yeah so it, it is a very severe situation thank you very much for sharing the situation in india so so we only have eight minutes to the end so uh, can i ask all panelists to give the few words to the audience to bring them back to the home so just i only you <laughs> do one minute but could you please um give the word so uh, the Professor Dakia first, thank you. I think we tried to explain that uh, COVID-19, the experience uh, is happening at a, a regional level. The differences are regional level, country level, and population level. And we also see that um, people are diverse group of people are experiencing it differently so women in here we have focused on that and many women experiencing diverse range of um, uh, crises and most of these crises are lead from the financial situation to psychological situation home environment and all this and we need to see that uh, because of the lockdown because of the social distancing and, and isolation uh, that has created other social issues. So this was to save the health um, and spread of the disease, which is causing some other um, problems and issues and crises. So we need to focus on those as well. So and policymaker and, uh, and educationists and social scientists need to work together to combat not only the health issues, combat the social issues, and also address the population who are at risk of having these issues in particular women and those who are vulnerable. So I would like to say that everybody work together as a collaborate, collaborative work and we face this challenge, not only in COVID-19 now, post COVID-19, we need to face this and do something more positive so that positive outcome can come for all a sphere of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adakia. So the Professor Nien Tang, Nien Tang please. Uh, please put off the mute. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we have to prepare for the um, pandemic during and post, and uh, several very important lessons we learned during the uh, from the early two thousand twenty until now is that working together, collaborative between the um, politic uh, political will is very important. Quick response. Um, and also very consistent message to the community and also very uh, to, to have a priority policy to, to tackle for to solve the problem for the vulnerable group is also important. So that's all. Thank you very much. So next, um, Professor Kauri Mutol. So please give us some word. Yeah, um, thank you very much again um, to organize in this uh, wonderful webinar. And uh, my last words are uh, uh, countermeasures um, against infectious diseases are justified to restrict people's rights. 
and especially destroyed, acquired diverse rights of socially vulnerable people during the early phase to combat. And, and I myself, uh, collaboration with scientists and politicians and government officials, uh, really wonderful experiences, but really tough to let them understand the uh, personal choices and the core values. However, I believe that uh, we were given the chance to overcome classical sociological issues to overcome with COVID-19. So during the post-COVID-19, uh, I'd like to continue to call nothing about us without us inside the government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, strong message. So next, uh, the Professor Akram. Uh, I would like to talk about two things. Uh, first thing is this, uh, as a student of sociology and then public health. Uh, let us begin with public health. Basically, man, need, man needs to understand that, that, that human beings are not above the nature. So the declaration that the, we are, uh, we have, there is an epidemiological transition and the communicable diseases are over. So actually COVID-19, the biggest message it has given that communicable diseases are not over and we need to prepare ourselves better for that we need to keep our immune system well prepared that is the most important thing and the second thing is this uh, student of sociology basically uh, we need to on and the state needs to remain very cautious very cautious to protect the social ethos. Otherwise, basically we are landing towards a larger problem. Any problem may become a larger problem if we keep ourselves distance from the social ethos and the social welfare values. Thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you very much, Professor Akram. So uh, to the end, the Mike Sachs, please. Dr. Mike Sachs, okay. Professor. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, it's, um, it's great to uh, have been here and to have had these discussions. And I, I just want to give, well, so make two points really. I mean, I think the first is that in this whole process of responding to COVID-19, we need balance. It isn't a question of say, yeah, lock down and protect ourselves. We've got to actually um, also be attentive to the social issues. So it can't just be a clinical domain it's got to be some, a balance. And I think um, that the, actually the health and social aspects are very closely interrelated, almost inseparable actually, in terms of going forward. The second issue I wanted to raise, which we haven't discussed so far, is the question of vaccine. Because um, you know, the world holds its breath for a vaccine. I actually think there are interim positions, you know, so, you know, we can, we can have great testing regimes, which will take us a long way forward in terms of making the new normal, not so different from where we are now, not dramatically different as it might be without um, great testing facilities and vaccine. But I think when we start talking about vaccines, we enter the domain of political sociology, really, because, you know, there's recently been a headline in England, you know, saying that even if a vaccine was discovered tomorrow, it would take two years to get the infrastructure in place to roll it out, even for vulnerable groups. So, you know, I mean, you don't hold your breath about it, but what, where we, what we enter there is the whole arena of commercial interests that we haven't discussed, because commercial interests are really important in this domain. Because a lot of countries or companies are fighting to be the first to get a vaccine because there's a load of money to be made from it. And, and you know, we need to recognize that this isn't just, a, again, a clinical domain. It is a domain in which sociologists, social scientists, political scientists, economists, all the, the, the whole spectrum of, of um, the social scientific world needs to be involved. And I think if we can bring all this together, we can indeed have a better world. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you very much for all. It is very productive meeting. And, you know, to the end, the Mike proposed a very interesting and important topics to all of us. So there are so many areas we should explore and discuss and investigate. Thank you very much. 
So I think it is really nice, uh, the webinar. So I truly appreciate all of the participants today. So I'd like to pass the, uh, the voice to the Ina. Thank you very much for attending the conference. I'm going to say thank you as well. Thank you so much, everybody, the panelists and the participants. Thank you. Thank you all for attending the day one of the APSA 2020 webinar on COVID-19, climate and health. To all attendees, please um, fill out our evaluation survey. That's bit.ly slash APSA 2020 day one. That's bit.ly. APSA 2020 Day 1. And if you want to look at our Book of Abstracts, it is available online as well through our Facebook page, facebook.com slash APSA 2020 Manila. We hope we see you again tomorrow for Day 2 of our webinar. Thank you very much.